Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. Did you know that we offer one-on-one -on -one coaching? This includes six months of one-on-one -on -one coaching. For more information, go to jasonhartman.com. It's my pleasure to welcome Jean Hamilton. She comes to us from Seattle today, and she's the founder of Speaking Results. And she has a, a varied background that she brings to the speaking business in terms of coaching people and consulting with both individuals and companies on improving presentation skills. I think you'll like this interview from a fundamental standpoint. And she has three different sort of angles, if you will, that you'll hear about during the interview. And I think it'll be very valuable to you. Jean, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here, Jason. Well, good. My pleasure. So you have a, a pretty diverse and eclectic background. Tell us a bit about how you got started with speaking results. Well, originally I was a professional modern dancer, and then I became a mime. This isn't your typical route to public speaking. No, I <laughs> wouldn't I thought, think that a mime would no. be a <laughs> public speaker. But I thought, all right, time to learn to talk. So I, I did a lot of speaking classes and, of course, got involved in Toastmasters and National Speaker Association. And then I also got certified in neurolinguistic programming, which is often referred to as NLP, and that helps people overcome limiting beliefs, overcome fears, overcome fear of speaking. And about, it was in 1998, I brought all of my past lives together and I created speaking results. And essentially, I work with people to help them develop that nice, clear, crisp message, tell great stories, and deliver them with confidence and authenticity. You know, my feeling is whatever career you're in, <laughs> good presentation skills help you be even more successful. And if you're speaking a lot, there's always an opportunity to take it to that next level. Yeah, so, you know, you really have uh, three approaches. One that you just mentioned, which is the NLP technique, which, you know, I think is very important, and we'll talk about that. What are the other two, Jean? Well, I have a theater background, and I do quite a bit of improvisational theater, and that really helps people loosen up, be able to think on their feet. And then, of course, storytelling. I, I think storytelling is crucial to all presentations, even one-on-one -on -one presentations as well as formal presentations. No question about it. Well, in terms of, of using these different these different three areas, which are, which I couldn't agree more, they're vitally important. Maybe let's start with NLP or neuro linguistic programming. Of course, Bandler and Grinder discovered, I guess I should say that, or invented it. Probably more discovered many many years ago, and then Tony Robbins popularized it. But certainly, many people have benefited from it both from the platform and in one-on-one -on -one interactions, whether they be sales relationships, etc. Tell us about how to use it at the platform. Well, there's several ways. First of all, if somebody is a little uncomfortable in a certain situation, NLP can definitely help them really be at their best. I mean, and, and Grindler and Bandler, they were looking to when people are doing a really excellent job at something, what are they doing? What are they thinking about? And so that's when you want to think, how can you be at your very, very best when you're presenting? How do you look? How do you feel? How do you sound? And get that very rich and vivid for yourself. I mean, we, we always make ourselves right. So you want to 
think about what it is you want to propel your speaking to that next level. There's also, of course, the whole issue of getting rapport with your audience, and people will learn visually, they'll learn auditorily, and they'll learn um, kinesthetically. So as a speaker, you want to make sure you're tapping into all those different areas of learning. And there's a lot of material, NLP, that shows you how to do that. Excellent. You know, any examples of, of how a speaker might be using this, appealing to the different senses of the audience, the three main modalities, I guess I should say, auditory, visual, kinesthetic, any examples you can think of offhand? Well, sure. Just in how you say something, you can use visual words, look, see, how, how does that look to you? For an auditory person would be, does that sound good? And a kinesthetic person would be, does that feel right? So you're using all of those different words from the um, different modalities there. And if somebody is very kinesthetic, the feel one will really make sense to them. And the same with a visual person or auditory person. So it's more like you're speaking their language. And what NLP is great for is what I call flexibility of behavior. The more that you're flexible, which is a kinesthetic word, I'm I'm more kinesthetic, but the more that you are able to go into those different modalities, again, you're reaching that audience. So, you, you know, look through your presentation and just be thinking, am I using all of those different types of words? Excellent. And improv, I mean... Of course, thinking on your feet is a good thing for a trial lawyer, a public speaker, a salesperson, anybody. Tell us about how you bring the the world of acting in, into speaking. I mean, do you want to cite Ronald Reagan? <laughs> you know, he was a great <laughs> speaker, and, uh, right. and and by most people's thinking, a great president. But a lot of people, his critics especially on the left, said, well, he's an actor. He, he never really did much as an actor, frankly, or, or did very well at it, I right. should say. He, he was a B actor. <laughs> yeah, but he sure did well yeah. as a president, that's for sure. Yeah, well, certainly as a speaker, he knew how to relate to people and you know, make them feel at ease and almost like they knew him. I think he had that very engaging style there. He he, he did, and, and, and what's interesting about it is even his opponents, like his friend Tip O'Neill, who was Democrat, of course, Speaker of the House, he was able through his communication skills to really reach across the aisle and and get a lot of stuff done. Compare him to his predecessor, Jimmy Carter, who made like no alliances and, and just couldn't accomplish much. He's doing very well now, uh, Jimmy Carter, in, in, in communicating with variety of people more through nonprofits. And he's had a more successful post-presidency, I'd say. Right. But anyway, getting, getting back to theater. So you know, theater has taught me a lot of different things. First of all, the you know, as a speaker, you talk a lot about pause. Everybody hears the importance of pause. And I've been talking about that for years, that, that the pause will really make a moment more juicy. It will help people really get involved in what you're saying. Recently, I was taking a theater class, and I learned it at a whole another level. We were given an exercise. It was a, a script, very banal script, frankly. The, the, I'll say it for you. It was for two people. Hi, hello, what'd you do last night? Not much. How about you? Oh, watch a little TV. Anything good? No, not really. See you later. Okay. All right, so that's the script. Not much to it, right? Well, then we were given situations. And my situation was I was in a hospital. I had a brain tumor, two months to live. And my brother, who I had been very close to, was coming to visit me for the very first time. And that was our script. And I first thought, there's no way in the world I would say that. But that was the script. That's what I had to use. Well, by the end of the scene, I'm crying real tears. I didn't try to cry. I'm crying real tears. And the reason was the time we took in between what we said. And the time we took in between was so rich and so full of communication. I mean, it was very, very powerful. And so it made me think about speaking. I mean, that that so much of what we say when we let something go out there and really open ourselves up to being with the audience in a very real way, that a lot of communication can happen there if we have the ability to be vulnerable to let that happen. And it's interesting, though, why does the, the pregnant pause do that? What, what is it about it that, I mean, I guess it gives the audience time to think, 
right? Or time to let it sink in. Yeah, it gives them time to get involved. It gives them time to connect with you, time to sink, to let the message sink in. But you, but it's not just as a speaker sitting there and counting. <laughs> but okay, I'm going to do my long pause here now and count. You have to be completely present with what you're saying. So it's like you're still talking in some way. You're still communicating. You're just letting there be some more space. And like I say, it's through that acting class that I learned that more than, than uh, doing speech training. The other thing, uh, and this is more about improvisational theater, is a lot of people want to feel more comfortable speaking extemporaneously. And you think, well, how can you practice that? I mean, once you, w- w- once you actually practice something, it's not spontaneous anymore, right? So it's a little hard to practice being spontaneous. But I've found the very best way is through some theater improv exercises because they teach you how to become more comfortable reacting from impulse. They, they help you tap into that. And the more that you're able to do that, then when you're up on a stage, that becomes more natural to you as well. It really helps you. They help you become free and loose so that you can really tap more into your authentic style. Nobody likes a speaker that's too contrived or too practiced. You know, you, you want to be real. You want to communicate that sense of trust. It's interesting how this has evolved, Gene, too, because I, I like to watch old movies sometimes, and in the vast majority of them, the acting is just, it's so stilted and stiff. And yeah. nowadays, the actors are, are so much more fluid. I mean, it's just so natural now. It, it's a, it's amazing how that's changed in just the matter yeah. of a few decades. You're right. You're absolutely right. And I think the style of speaking has changed, too, of public speaking. I think it used to be much more formal and stilted of what was considered to be a good speaker. And and now people want authenticity. They want you to be real. Right. And, you know, when I say that, it almost sounds like you're you're making it up. But it is acting to some extent. I mean, that's the way you get the point across is by delivering it in in a certain way. Right. And I think it's also good as a speaker to be also very present, very in the moment, so that if something occurs to you that's a little bit different because of the audience you have there, that you go with that as well. That that audiences love it when people that are speaking are also in that process of discovery with them. That you go, ooh, oh yeah, that's that's exciting. So if you let yourself get into that state of learning while you're also speaking, it can become even richer. I, I'm not saying you go into something and just wing it. <laughs> I mean, I think it's really important if you want to persuade people to have a really strong, good message that's right under your belt, that's in your bones, and, and you're ready to deliver, that that's there. And at the same time, you are so present and open to your audience that you might discover some other things along the way. And that, that's what I love about speaking. You can always keep learning things. You can always keep growing. Yeah, no question about it. Let's maybe switch gears here, if we can, to uh, storytelling. And storytelling has been, of course, used for millennia now to make points. And back to the days of Aristotle, he talked about it. And Oh, I would say back to the, you know, caveman days. Right. Oh, yeah, sure. But, uh, but we don't have much documentation on that. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I'm sure it was used that so what are the elements of, of good storytelling in, in, in public speaking situations? Well, first of all, you want to make sure it's relevant to your topic. So that it's, you can have a really great story, but if it's not relevant to what you're talking about, people will wonder why the heck you're taking the time to say it. So that's, that's key, you know, number one that it can make a point that is metaphoric. I mean, you can tell a story from when you were a kid, but it could be something that you learned that is relevant to your topic. Then the best stories have conflict. And Joseph Campbell talks about this, that that there's a hero's journey and that the hero, which is usually you when you're telling your story, goes through some pain, goes through conflict, is on a quest. And then there is a moment of learning. There's this aha, 
And as a result, you are a different person than you were before the conflict. And so a, a really good story will have this universal type learning that you receive that relates to your topic there. The other thing that's important is set it up succinctly. A lot of times stories will go on too long and then you start to lose your audience. So you want to think of setting it up succinctly and jumping into that conflict. And then, and this is again where some acting comes into, it's much more effective when you become the characters. So you bring in dialogue. Dialogue's the best way to suddenly you know, make a story pop. So you, you become a character that says something a certain way and you, you take on his body. You relive the action and then it, it becomes something that has more impact for people. In, in terms of elements, so, so certainly showing the struggle is very important. And it's funny because I, I see that format a lot from the platform. But, but you know, I also see some great speakers that, that don't use that format. Are, are they just, could they be even greater with it? I mean, should it always be used? Or are, are there times when the, I sort of think it's like people's need for drama almost. They need to see the ups and the downs and the highs and the lows and the, the breadth of the, the discussion, right? Right, right. I mean, I don't think every story needs to have this huge drama, but even just a, a little bit of a moment where you were a little conflicted about what you wanted to do, or or there was this moment that, let's say, it can be a small conflict, and there's still a learning there. But but I think, you know, essentially, is does it work? And I don't think there's hard and fast rules for everything here or anything that that what works well for one person might not work quite as well for another but i think it's as a speaker and wanting to grow just keep stretching yourself so if you haven't been using stories that have any conflict in well then look for some in your life that do and you know basically or create some conflict (laughs) great maybe maybe we have enough conflict in the world here (laughs) need to create some more usually it happens You're right, people, we we do like our drama, but a conflict, it it does make things interesting, and almost every single movie you see out there, it follows this formula. If a movie didn't have any conflict at all, we'd probably find it a bit boring. So is it, if, if a speaker listening wants to use more storytelling, do they always have to use their own stories, or is there a place they can go to find good stories? Well, the best stories come from your own life because nobody else has read those or seen those, and and they are your most authentic story. They don't have to always have you as the main character. It can also be a story from somebody you know or somebody you've witnessed. The one no-no is, uh, you know, don't use stories from other speakers without their permission, and that's, that's like stealing their stories. So... If there's a story you hear from a speaker, you really, really, really want to use it. Make sure you get their permission. Yeah, to don't don't steal their that. signature stories. That's for no, sure. No, certainly not. And and you know, and frankly, it's just not even a good idea, even with their permission, because particularly if people know that that's their signature story, it's so uh, woven into that person that it will seem odd to have you tell it. It's really best to look at your own life and and different people within your life, maybe different mentors and teachers that you've had. Your family. Families are good for finding stories as well. Yeah, I guess my next question kind of moves back to the direction of NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. But, you know, maybe let's talk about body language and voice quality, tonality. And some people, I mean, it, recently in the news, we've all heard the story of the golden voice, right? I mean, it's amazing. Some people just have a, a voice that commands attention. Right. And just the room just perks up and listens because they're talking. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, some people have a real gift of, of you know, what they were born with. And, and you know, James Earl Jones that, that, you know, have a voice that's just so rich that people love. The thing is, no matter what, just like exercising the body, you can exercise your voice and get it better. Through uh, these, again, through theater, you can learn some vocal exercises. Usually it starts with breathing. A lot of times people, if they have a stress-sounding voice, it usually means they're not breathing deeply enough and that there's tension in the throat. 
vocal unpleasant voices result from from tension. And so there's vocal exercises where you can, again, breathe, hum, make some strange sounds. You want to make sounds that really fill the room in a nice, resonant way. And you can get better as you do it. And then, of course, using dynamics, coloring your words. Not all words are created equal. You want to think of how can you show which words you emphasize with how you intone it, how you color the words. And like I say, your voice can improve with exercise. I just recently was taking a singing class. and I've always had this belief I have a terrible singing voice just you know, cannot hold a tune. But last week I went to a singing class with singers there, and by the end of the class I, I actually stood up and sang Three Blind Mice <laughs> to the group, and I had so much fun. And some of the notes didn't sound so good, but some of them actually sounded good. And it made me realize with practice, if I decided to focus on this, I actually could become a good singer. It takes practice. You can work on your voice and change it. Do you want to give an example of maybe some voice exercises and also improv exercises, I guess, at the same time real quickly for the listeners? Oh, sure. So, like I say, the breathing in and out, you're, you're letting your belly, you put your hand on, on your belly there and breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth to just feel the belly going up and down. You want to make sure that the the belly actually moves out. And then after you um, have done a bit of that, just even making some sounds like just a ha, 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 you're letting the um, sound reverberate through. And if you wanted to do some improv exercises, I like to do start something that's called a sound ball. And this is making any type of sound at all that that just spontaneously wants to come out. And you want to play with me here a little bit, Jason? Sure, let's do it. Okay, so so I'm going to throw you a sound. And I actually have never done this over the phone. I usually do it in person. But <laughs> you think of throwing you the sound. You're going to catch that sound, repeat that sound, and then you throw a different sound back at me. And the thing you want to think about is don't try to make the cute, perfect, right sound, the clever sound, whatever, just whatever sound wants to come out. So right. I'm going to be saying, you're going to throw it to me, and I'm going to be saying two things, repeating your sound and, and, and giving you a new one, and then you've got to repeat mine and give me a new one. Exactly, got exactly. It. Okay, so I go, wonka. Wonka. Boing. Boing. Chow. Ping. Oh, I didn't say chow, darn it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's do that again. Right. Go ahead, you throw one at me. Chow, ping, ping, bong, bong, <laughs> Okay, good. Now, another thing that you can do after you do that, and they say that's just to get you loosened up. It, it, it sounds silly, it sounds crazy, I know, but it gets you loosened up, it gets you playful. Then there's word ball, and that's where I throw a word to you. You repeat that word, and then any word at all, you throw back to me. Okay? So plant. House. Okay, so you want to repeat plant, and then oh, you throw uh, house. Oh, sorry. Okay. See, I'm, I've got to be a better student here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> You're doing so, great. You're so doing great. Here we go. Plant, house. Yeah. House. Bridge. Bridge, road. Road, car. Car, airplane. Airplane, chair. Chair, couch. Couch, um, pinochle. <laughs> okay, I get the idea. Okay. Pina, pinochle, so, you know, uh, some, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> well, the thing that's really interesting about that is when you play it, suddenly there seems like there's probably just about 20 words in the world, and that's it. Right, that's true. <laughs> Did You're you get right. that sense? Uh-huh. Ah, ah, what do you think of? What do you think of? And and that's the thing. The more that you just play with it, the easier it becomes. You realize, well, we do have quite a few words out there we can draw from. And like I say, it's one of those exercises that helps the develop that spontaneity muscle. And really the key to it is just being relaxed, just just being relaxed and going for it, having fun with it. And then by doing these type of exercises, it becomes easier to be in that mode when you're up speaking. Another exercise I like, it's called the minister's cat. And this one is where you keep a rhythm. And I'd say you start with the letter A, and I'd say the minister's cat is an awesome cat. 
and the next person would go, and they'd keep with A, say maybe the minister's cat is an aggressive cat, the minister's cat is an angular cat, and you keep going on and on like that until you can't think of one, and then you just move to the letter B. The minister's cat is a bald cat, the minister's cat is a blank cat, I, and I, I actually love doing this exercise even by myself in the car when I'm driving to a speech, because it gets me quicker on my feet, and the more that you can just be light and loose with it. And sometimes what's really fun is I'm doing the exercise and I have no idea what I'm going to say and then that word just pops out of my mouth and I think, oh, that's a, that's a nice word. So, again, these um, exercises are fun for just helping you stretch, learn, grow, and essentially just be more free with how you speak. Yeah, I agree. And you noticed what I, what I noticed. And by the way, you forgot to mention the minister's cat as an alley cat. But um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, there's, there's a lot. There were a lot more A words I, know. I didn't tend to. <laughs> I could have gone on for a very long time, but your listeners might have gotten tired of it. In doing these little, and I'm going to just call them dorky exercises, you know, you know what I noticed right away? She's a dorky cat. Is, is it, there you go. That's for the Ds. Is that... We both were laughing, and it is as subtle and maybe insignificant as that seems, right before taking the stage, isn't it good to have just a dumb laugh like that? that oh, that, definitely. That just loosens you up because, of course, you're always thinking as you're taking the platform, is the audiovisual going to work? How am I going to be received? Am I going to stumble when I come on stage? All, All right. of these things go yeah. through the speaker's head, and I know it's not just me who thinks that. Yeah, no, no, everybody no. does. What? There's obviously a lot of different things to think about and things that you need to take care of. And, you know, when usually speakers are, like myself, a bit perfectionist there. The thing that you know, I'm sure your listeners have heard, people will often forget what you said, but they will remember how you made them feel. And the state that you're in, how open are you? How much does it look like you're really enjoying yourself will have a big impact on how you make them feel. And you want to feel when you're up there in front of them that there's no place you'd rather be than right there with them. And so, like I say, the looser you can get, the more present you can get, the the better it's going to be for both you and your audience. So, Jean, where can people learn more about your upcoming events and products and so forth? Well, people could go to my website, speakingresults.com, or give me a call, 206 933 I offer private presentation coaching. I also come into companies and offer small group training. Excellent. Well, Gene Hamilton, Speaking Results, thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure, Jason. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.